Welcome to the VoxGig podcast. We talk to people in the developer community about developer relations, public speaking, and community events. For more details, visit voxgig.com slash podcast. All right, let's get started. I have a wonderful guest today, Vicky Lee, a coder, speaker, and community organizer who has made a big impact on the world of the Python programming language. Vicky is a software engineer by trade, who has been a pathfinder for the future of tech events, showing how to improve participation, diversity, and inclusiveness by actually doing it. Join me for a great chat with Vicky, where we learn the importance of planting our friends in the audience. Vicky, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's great to have you here. And thanks for inviting me to come have a chat with you. Yeah, um, you do uh, an amazing range of different things, um, but I'm going to start with with one of the questions I really, I really like asking. Uh, what was the very first event that you organized, and was it successful? Uh, is the very first? Is this tech or non tech? Tech or non tech. I suppose um, this is, I only realized this after a number of years after running tech events, that my very first event was pretty much a non-tech event. It was, uh, I also, on the, before um, all these tech organizations that, are, that I founded, I, I'm also um, Irish-Chinese born. So I run an Irish-Chinese forum and blog. And uh, I suppose the very first meeting was actually meeting some of the people from the forum. Um, like mind the people like myself, uh, especially those who speak Cantonese and stuff. I, uh, I don't know. It was like from my point of perspective, it was success because the people said that they turn up and they turn up and it wasn't that many. I think it was like two or three, and they was complete strangers. And I met up with them, and this is way before me that came along. Uh, so, so they I, actually I, turned up. They turned <laughs> That's up. success. That's success. <laughs> they were saying, "I want to meet up," and said, "Okay, I'm pretty terrified, but I should be okay meeting up in a public space during the daytime. It should be grand." And uh, so it was good to see someone face to face and talk to them, especially in a language that I don't get to speak that often when I'm here in Dublin, uh, which is Cantonese. So I say that was a success, even though it was a small meetup. But I didn't think of it at the time. I thought it was just. Um, I, I suppose at the time I was, uh, I wanted to meet with a lot of different people at the time, back in the days when forums um, were like, you know, the, the message boards were quite popular. There was a lot of chatter around that and um, people yeah. tend to talk and have fun, but meeting face to face was quite rare. So uh, whenever, when opportunity arises and said, want to meet up, I said, okay. And then follow on from that, I suppose, um, I, uh, I've met more folks like myself that were born here and we tried to speak Chinese, but we ended up speaking English, but we, we had regular meetups, more, more, more food related. So we meet up for dim sum and things like that. But I never thought of those as actually my very first event. I just thought it was, Hey, just meet up and have a chat over coffee or something. But none of the, I mean, you, you were the person who made them happen. I think that's sort of the key thing, isn't it? To be, to be the organizer. Yeah, I didn't actually think of being an organizer. People are saying, let's meet up. Say, okay. And I just arranged the time and the place. So probably that how, maybe, maybe that for me, I just want to connect with people. That's how I got started. And, you know, just say, yeah, let's, let's do a meetup. And before meetup came around. And um, never, I only thought about officially being an event organizer when I started running um, Python Ireland meetups, I suppose, in the mid, uh, mid-2005. So when you asked that question there, I kind of thought back saying, oh, yeah, I actually ran stuff way before Python Ireland, and it was community, community-based as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to, to um, think about how people end up as, as organizers uh, and what motivates, what motivates us to do crazy things, sitting there waiting for, for people to turn up at our event, hoping that we don't, we don't end up having to drink all the beer ourselves. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about, about how you ended up running events, uh, I guess your life story? So my journey, okay, after I, um, so for my first, very first tech event was running Python Ireland meetups. So when I, I encountered Python in the early 2000s, uh, thanks to uh, my now husband, uh, we, were all, we were always looking for new ways of uh, making life easier for ourselves when we're at work. And uh, Python definitely helped. And when I, uh, back in the early 2000s, you barely get one or two technical seminars or meetups. 
I suppose, gatherings. Um, and, and you normally find them via the Irish Linux user group mailing lists or word of mouth. So I was delighted to be able to see the a Python, a Python meetup and, and talking to people about Python um, outside of my company, even though there wasn't that many Python people because at the time it was relatively new. And uh, when you look up um, any job search sites, only two of them appear, two developer jobs, you know, compared to nowadays. And it was the person who founded uh, Python Ireland Meetup who, who she was seeking Python developers. So we turned up, it was quite a good turnout, about 30, 30 35 people turned up. That took a hiatus, um, that was back in, that was in 2004. And another person took over and rebooted Python Ireland the following year. Uh, hardly anyone turned up, as in zero people turned up apart from the organizer in the first month or two. There you go. <laughs> so he, I was telling him, why didn't you put up the sign? And that was the worst part. He did put up the sign, but he was still drinking on his own. <laughs> Oh. Um, so we eventually a few of us turned up and I joined and uh, we were really excited about Python and you know because it was new technology and and uh, I decided to you know uh, help them out running um, finding speakers and finding a venue and I think I just start I just kept doing it uh, until I suppose relatively recently probably a few years ago when I decided to step back completely around 2015, 2016, and I was kind of shout, helping people to do the handover to the community then. And uh, yeah, that was an amazing experience. The community, I was, I'm being with the community for that long because uh, they were so welcoming. Uh, everyone was willing to learn and willing to teach. And, uh, and um, I think where I am right now wouldn't have been, well, wouldn't be where I am right now without the Python community, uh, uh, be it here in Ireland, and I got to meet a lot of people internationally as well, like the, the, the Python UK, Python UK folks, uh, the European Python folks or the EuroPython folks, and some of the US as well. And uh, the journey has been amazing. So I've been helped since being curious about how to run a conference because we want folks wanted to run um, the European Python conference here. And we just weren't set up for it uh, back in 2009. Yeah. Um, I remember that fateful night on... Uh, February 2010, when we're sitting in uh, Neary's, as you do, where all good ideas come out of our yeah. stuff. I was the only sober one, trying to calm people down, saying we cannot run a conference, our very first ever conference in two months' time. It's just, we just don't have anything. Or the, the most people we ever had in our meetups were 20, 25 tops. That was like, <laughs> and running a conference at the time, Europe Python had about 250 or 300 people, which is huge from our point of view. And so I managed to talk them down from two months or talk them up from two months to, to try to prepare a conference in four months later. or five which, months is, later. which is still a pretty tight deadline. Right. Yeah, given yeah. that we had nothing, we had no sponsors, no venue, no nothing, we had no clue apart from like running small little meetups every month. And we, we got there in July and we, uh, what we'd, uh, we had about, we, we were planning to have about 40 people turn up. So double the amount of people that come to our meetups. And we had nearly a hundred people turn up. Wow. And we had people from international waters coming along. Bear, bear in mind that around that time, around 2010, uh, the PyCon uh, kind of um, events around the world, there wasn't that many. There was a, the big PyCon US, there was EuroPython, it was the French, German, ones i don't know if the spanish ones were around but definitely the uk one and then we were like the sixth or seventh you know uh um icon, uh, just, icon. something to be really really proud of um yes. it yes. sounds like there's this uh, symbiosis between a great community and a great event um and it feels like you have to have the great community first really Oh, yes, because you need the support of everyone. Even though it feels like you're running this on your own, and I was lucky to have uh, my other half. He, he, he was like supporting. He had a supporting role because I remember the first, first very first conference we ran, um, I was supposedly be, supposed to be on a holiday to visit family in Hong Kong. And my mother keeps laughing that we spent most of our times in Starbucks on their Wi-Fi hotspot while I was handling, you know, T-shirts, speakers, and all. All that kind of stuff. Whereas from, like, Hong uh, from Hong Kong, my husband was dealing with the, the scheduling, to make, and we we're both working on the website. And he was making sure the schedule look look um, look okay for the for the program that was supposed to print. So I was talking to the printers as well. So I was dealing with all that, even though um, we had a team of people. But I think um, it just 
uh, became me and my husband uh, running the show the first year or two, but we had a lot of people turn up on, um, on closer to the events. Uh, they kind of, a lot of people helped, but I suppose uh, on the lead up to it, uh, people were just too busy and I was committed at that stage <laughs> and it was a learning experience. It was, it was great learning. I, I, yeah, it sounds like it. You, you were doing this. I mean, did you have a mentor or a guide or did you guys just figure it out yourselves? Well, we had, um, we based a lot of our stuff on our, with our, from our nice friends based, who ran PyCon uh, okay. UK. So a lot of their stuff were based on their community ethos and values as well and how they run things. Um, So I was asking them a lot of questions. And on our very first conference, we had the chair of the Python Software Foundation who looks after Python language itself came over just because we were, we were um, suddenly a new, a uh, new PyCon in this, you know, in the world. And there wasn't that many PyCons to speak of. And he was trying, he was curious on, um, on, on our conference. So he came along and helped us on the day as well, gave us tips and gave us encouragement. So yeah, so we were, most of the time we were learning, but I was asking questions as well. And uh, from running that, I learned a lot of, uh, I learned a lot. We, the conference grew year on year. So we had 150 to 200 to 180 that year. And we kind of uh, went up and up until we have um, about 400 nowadays. Uh, we kept it at 400 and something because that's how many you can fill in a plenary session in a hotel room. Uh, because yeah. bigger than that, you might as well have a huge. Uh, exactly. So that's, I, I, what would you say, what would you say was your biggest you know, because people to learn how to do things like run conferences, um, I always feel it's better not to make better to avoid mistakes rather than to do things right. In some senses, mistakes are worse. But what do you think was your biggest mistake? Maybe the first year or, or in, in, in establishing it? Um, um, putting your eggs in one basket for it after, after. Conference. Yeah. <laughs> the one uh, we had um, an after events in, uh, I think, in a pub. And they were supposed to do. They're supposed. To, they allowed us to bring in catering. They pulled out on the week of, and uh, <clears throat> uh, so we were panicking. And uh, because we had the venue where the host host the event, but we didn't have anywhere to host. Like have over nearly a hundred people trying to do, and, and some of them mightn't join with the after party. So we. So what are we going to do with all, what are we going to do with the food? And what about the entertainment? What's going to happen? And. Um, and uh, I want to shout out to uh, Radisson uh, Blue um, on Golden Lane. They were the one who were super helpful. They said that no customer is too small for them, no client. And they super, they helped us out that year. They let us use their bar. Like on that week, we just reserved the bar and the restaurant area. And they, they you know, so things like that, uh, being able to panic and saying, oh, where else can I host this? I think that was a not having a backup plan if things go wrong. I think that was the major one that I learned. So be able to make sure when you run something that you always have a backup or two. So don't don't assume that just because you've booked things, AV people, that they will come through. You've, you've got to have a, a, a plan B list of alternative suppliers, I guess. Very much so, yeah. And also um, be prepared. You, you you will lose out on, on some expenses, you know, so have a backup backup kind of um i think uh, i don't know what you call that kind of fund uh like like what you do in houses when you plan build houses like a sinking fund or something so have a pre- prepare some kind of funding that something might go wrong that uh, you know you might lose a deposit on something but you need to put you know you need the money for something else if that will if um, whatever service you're using is not available anymore yeah yeah so if i if i wanted to um if I wanted to run a conference, uh, well, let's say it's a community conference, um, you know, in a, in a new emerging language uh, or something in the tech space, uh, where do I start? What, what advice would you give to somebody who is inspired by what you've done um, or inspired by a great community and wants to turn that into a conference? Uh, I would reach out to the community first. Yeah, uh, that's what I do. I would ask, would they be interested in getting involved? Or if I heard them hear them speak, I would ask, would they like to speak or give a workshop? And if they don't, and if they, uh, and also ask, uh, who would be interested in in who would they like to hear at the conference? 
and um, and I suppose um, also ask them like, would they like it to be hosted in you know, do they like Dublin? You know, do we host it somewhere else? And it really depends. A lot of my events are hosted in Dublin just because it's easy for me to go on site and, and do a lot of things. You know, because I, I I'm very hands on when I run events, uh, but I'm open to running things. Uh, and in different cities, as long as I have someone on site over there to help me follow up on logistics. So the big thing is community first. Whenever if it's completely if something completely new, especially if it's something that I'm just getting into, I will talk to the community because there's bound to be a meetup have started up. Um, or uh, and you if you say oh there's um, you can actually do the very first conference here in Ireland. You know the first Irish conference. You know so first thing I would do is reach out, ask, ask people if they like to get involved, who do they want to hear, what do they want to do, do they want to do a workshop or is it talks or panels or, or a networking event. Um, so yeah, it's to me like um, I'm, in, I'm a very small piece in, in, in the conference. The, for me is the, the main priority is the community, what do they want to listen to, what do they want to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's about the first thing I would do. Yeah, it's uh, it goes back to that. Uh, it goes back to the, the fact that you need a you need a great community first, ultimately to 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 run a great event. Um, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious about your um, about your background. So you're a self described uh, Pythonista. What 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 is a Pythonista? I like Python. I like to code in Python, I suppose. And I think uh, that's it's more than that, though, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, no, the, I think the core is that you just like to code in Python and like to spread the word about Python and tell people to use it, even though it's not it's not the end all be all tool. Just, uh, each each kind of um, technology, you know, uh, solves a certain solution. So Python doesn't solve everything, but for me, it has solved a lot of the things that I worked on. You know, it helped me, you know, be more lazy, I suppose. <laughs> like, that's, a, that's a virtue of a programmer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I try to, I want to engineer my way out of problems, you know, so I just, so my other half gives out to me saying, you know, you find a problem, you can't engineer your way. It's like, yes, I can. It's more because I don't work as a coder, as in professionally, I don't, I have, um, I'm more of a fo- volunteer in running tech events, so I don't code as much anymore. So any opportunity I find if there's a problem, I'll try and see if there's a way I can actually write code and solve it. <laughs> but you start. I mean, you started your career working for uh, some microsystems, I think. Um, you know, which is, I mean, that's pure engineering. It's it's uh, coding all day long. Is that what you always wanted to do? Uh, is that the, the career that you saw for yourself, or how, how did you end up? It's always interesting to know how people ended up um, in in the career that they started out in. Uh, I suppose uh, I've always been curious about technology. Um, I think big thanks to my my dad. He's always been interested in in, in new innovation and new tech. He's always attracted to shiny things, and I think um, I'm that's the reason why I'm attracted to shiny things. So when I was even very young, when I was three or four years old, I remember waking up like suddenly waking like at three or four in the morning and seeing like him in front of this thing this monitor with his, his face is like glowing green because of you know the reflection reflection from the monitor and I can hear this tick tick sound he was typing away clunk 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 but he's been he he always like like getting new computers and stuff and he lets me play around with it he doesn't say that I, I'm gonna break it or anything like that. He just lets me play around, and um, he's also. As I got older, he he was happy for me to build my own computers and stuff like that, and I was able to. Um, and we were lucky enough that we had uh, internet access in the good old days. Was it ni- 1997 or something like that? Around that period, six ninety six ninety seven. And, uh, and that's where I started to look at creating my own web pages because um, HTML was uh, just, you know, was relatively new and very basic. And I, I was just playing around and I was sharing pictures pretty much like to myself because not many of my friends had internet access. And I think it just went down from there. The curiosity started to like looking to, and then <clears throat> the uh, early 2000s when the blogging engines were, you know, self-hosted blogging engines, you, you, you know, uh, I started looking into that. So um, and just writing my own blogs, again, sharing pictures before all the social media stuff came along. So um, that's how I pretty much like got into it. And I think the first time I actually uh, wrote my, my first proper site was uh, for the Irish born Chinese site, I suppose, because I was looking for people like me. And most of them, most of these sites were based in the UK. So the British born Chinese sites. 
And I asked one of them, you know, do they have an Irish, Irish born Chinese side? And they said, no, why don't you start up one? So I was humming and hawing for ages. I had to, that means I had, I was thinking I had to deal with strangers. How do I handle this? How do I handle forums? But I, I, I kind of, uh, just rolled up my sleeves and did it. <laughs> and, uh, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Uh, and I suppose that was my kind of hobby side, just um, playing around with web stuff. Uh, whereas in Sun, I was I started off in localization, but we had to do um, we we built a lot of um, uh, we built we were in charge of the EMEA side of things for localization and built a lot of packages for Solaris and I was I looked after patching in the end and we we used Python a lot to um, as wrappers to to improve um, I suppose uh, the, the the build process of these packages and helping with testing as well and so I learned Python through as a scripting language first because I, those days it was okay. a or, or gluing, gluing applications together uh, before any web apps and stuff like that. It was, it was still very early days. And then I started getting to, you know, seeing all these web frameworks starting to appear in Python and start to play around with them as well. So it was great to see the evolution as things go along. Now there's just so many libraries and tools, especially in Python side of things that I can't even keep up. So I just sign up to all these newsletters and see all this. <laughs> New shiny stuff. <laughs> I know it's terrible. It's terrible, isn't it? There's too much good stuff in the world. Well, Sun Microsystems is a, a, a welcoming place to work. Uh, with hindsight, how, how would you describe I mean, Sun that had, has this reputation of looking after engineers? But I'm interested in um, what that was like on the ground. And I mean, also from uh, you know, a subject that's very pertinent these days is, is how they did on diversity uh, back in those days. It was an amazing place at the time. I didn't really think about diversity. I just thought I just um, was, I, I just thought myself would be very lucky to be part of this um, uh, humongous company. And uh, the very first year, they I, I got to go over to to California. Um, oh wow! Really That's over awesome. all expensive pay and all, and get to meet the team over there. So we we have like you know the, the U.S. team, the, we have the Asian team, and the Japanese team, and we were like Dublin was the main media. So they each each quarter they they move between different sit different you know um, different groups to have their all hands, and I was invited to go over you know, and that was amazing. You hear companies saying, "Oh, we'll send you to this," you know, at the university when they're trying to recruit people. And you didn't, didn't believe it until they actually do. And my jaw dropped and saying, is my passport up to date? So my top, top, of my, no, top of my head. And then I said, oh man, I have to tell my parents that I'm heading off to the US. <laughs> and for someone that's just come, just graduated, it's a very big thing. And they yeah. were very, everyone was like really, re, really happy in the job. Everyone loved it. Why? Why, why, was some, why, why did it have such a great culture? I, I, well, definitely in Dublin, we felt that everyone was just um, uh, just enjoyed what they did, and um, uh, and at the time uh, before before the latter years, um, it's like I, I left before Sun became uh, Oracle, taking it over. So, um, like, Sun really looked after us. Um, they they let, like I end up looking after team and. You know, you ask you ask for things, and you know they they pretty much like signed off on it. So you get to because we're we we have to be ahead of the curve when we run run the the operate, uh, run Solaris. So we get to um, order in like machines, not as big as the others. Like we don't we don't order like huge servers and things like that. But it's great to be able to say I want you know this set of machines, and then. A month later, you get them all under your name coming in through the door, and you get to set them up, and it's just the excitement of being able to just play around with stuff. And um, and and some of those machines were very uh, noisy. I remember <laughs> that some of them gave protection with uh, warnings about protecting your ears. That was the later years, though. Yeah, T one thousands and those sort of things. Yeah, so before I remember, the the labs were very quiet. You know, oh, okay. um, and, and then when when the bigger servers came in, we had to share with another group. And they dealt with servers a lot more, and their half was starting to get so noisy. It used yeah. to be a, a, a place where you can just go in, uh, do your work, and it was like a it's like a little pod that you can go in and just get away from people, you know, until until the the, the you know until the servers got got noisier and hotter as well. So that means <laughs> the labs got really cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I, I, do you think that there was like a, a conscious? Um, decision to to support diversity and sun or, or was it as was it unconscious that it just happened naturally because there was a good cultural structure in place 
I think it's uh, when I joined. I think there was a good mix of people anyway. And, yeah. Uh, I, uh, at the time, as I said, I wasn't thinking much about diversity. I think uh, they they hired people who were really excited about new technology, really excited to join Sun. And I joined as a graduate, so ha- um, I have to tell you to be honest. When I joined, I didn't know what I was. I didn't know what they were doing. Like even I read about it, it was words. But I didn't understand yeah. what they were doing. because college doesn't really, they don't really teach you a lot of, you know, what these no, companies do. No. These companies just roll on up and say we're hiring and then, you know, and you're trying to match them up to what you learned in college. It just doesn't match up because you're doing so much theory and say, how do I match up to what they're offering? Even I understand the words. I understand these, like there's engineering, but what of all these other roles? I don't understand, you know, you still yeah. have confusion. So I can imagine like um, the parents nowadays, you know, trying to figure out for their kids, you know, what kind of jobs, in, in, especially in tech, you know, there's jobs that are, haven't even been invented yet. So uh, like even when you're in the midst of it, going into a career, starting your career, you do, you sort of might be still slightly a bit fuzzy about the role you're going into because it's completely new, You, you know, um, because this company is very different to the company you intern for and the role is completely different. Uh, but you, but that's the whole thing is it's a challenge to learn something new. It's no, it's, it's no fun going to something which you know already and yeah. stagnate. Whereas you go into something and you, your learning curve goes way up and then, uh, and then, uh, you, you know, you get, and then you get to teach others as well. You start yeah. mentoring others after a while. Do you think it's, um, do you think it's better to, I mean, coming out of, of university, do you think it's better to, work in a big company, uh, or go and work in a startup. Um, and I suppose it's, it's only a question that's become relevant in, in recent years because, you know, back when we left college, the, there weren't that many startups really to go and work for. But now, nowadays you, you can find startups. They're all over the place. Um, so you have that choice. Uh, what do you think big company or startup? Um, if you want to, if, if you, <laughs> it depends if you want to get paid or not. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Uh, I suppose unless it's your own start and you know you can get the funding and you're okay that you won't be paid for a year or something like that and you have an, you know the you, you know as with all startups uh, you, you could be very lucky and you know and it could be you know uh, you could do very well out of it um, it really depends on people to be honest some people um, you know have this idea and they want to join or some people just are very adventurous I want to join the startup because they really believe on the, in it but um, and if they get paid, that's that's great. Um, if they don't, you know, I think maybe they 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 must have saved money beforehand, or they're living at home, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but Although I think I think it's a bit easier these days. There's a lot of um, growth stage startups, so I mean, they may not be making money, but they've they've had a lot of money invested in them, so they they are able to pay uh, market wages. Uh, it's less risky than it than it used to be, I think. Well, from there, so for joining a big company, it really depends on the individuals. To be honest, if you are, mm. if you want to get a few years' experience, um, because you're you're so when you graduate and you feel like you're super green and you want to super new and you know in the whole industry, and uh, you you want to save up some money, maybe I don't know if you have that much forethought, you know, to say, hey, I have to save money for my new startup. Um, maybe they're just happy to get some experience first as uh, for, for first um, four or five years or six to eight years and then people are always saying like my time uh, like 40 is new 30 or 30 is new 20 you know I, uh, yeah. by that, you have enough experience built and you have the money saved and uh, and maybe you can go on to a new venture but then the way that what i just said now could be very old school people don't think like that anymore uh, so no I, I mean one of the reasons i ask is i um i sort of went straight into startups yeah. and um it certainly has been difficult sometimes because i didn't have a a big name on my uh resume mm. a big recognizable names so people kind of discount you a little bit. Uh, my wife, uh, you know, she, she went to work for Ericsson and SAP. And that has always stood to her because those are instantly recognizable tech names. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you think do you think the Sun background has, has opened doors? Uh, I think it's more the community I'm involved in from my yeah, side. Yeah. 
So because Python is in everything, um, because I was feed, uh, because I I was the front for Python Ireland for for over a decade. I run the events, uh, monthly events. I run the conferences, the first four conferences, and I talk to a lot of people. I try to welcome everyone. Um, I talk to a lot of companies because of sponsorships and stuff or hosting. Uh, so from from that, uh, for me, it was um, that's uh, that's that's. That's the that's how I got into it. Anyway. That has been far more effective for you, absolutely. And that, I mean, that, that's a, that's one of the, the big arguments, isn't it, for for getting involved in events? Is it, it, it it's a much better way to to get to know people. And, and as, as, as I um, as I mentioned in the past, it doesn't have to be if you're getting involved in community. It does not have to be just in Ireland. As I say, I, like uh, I mentioned, I um, like uh, we wanted to host the Euro Python. Uh, event here we, we haven't done that uh, we, ha- we haven't been able to uh, but that's okay but for me I was really curious and uh, how they actually run a 200 person conference now they st- their conference is up to 2,000 people wow so they've grew a lot in the last 10 years but I was very curious uh, around 2012 2013 and they were looking for new board members I thought oh, why not I just joined the board see they- <laughs> that sounds dangerous <laughs> Yeah, I, did, I completely knew. I was talking to people remotely. We had meetings. We were uh, figuring how they run all because they move. Yeah. They they host it in a city for two years and then they move on to the next city. They move. So everything was um, for them was completely new every time they go to a new host city. But they've changed the way they run things where they have more work groups now, which is very interesting. Where they spread the workload amongst volunteers all over Europe, except for the core like. Um, stuff like logistics in, in that particular city and sensitive information like sponsorship and you know uh, attendee participation details and all that kind of stuff but everything else like call for proposals and uh, working on the websites and the program itself um, all the people are working remotely all over Europe um, to help um, for, to, to, to help out that Europe Python for that particular year, even though it's not in their city. And it was interesting to see how that community worked. And I learned a lot from that, especially with contracts, uh, a lot of kind of things that went wrong and how people tried uh, and how we uh, tried to resolve them. And then from via that, um, I also ended up being invited to join um, uh, in in the, in the overall uh, uh, Python Software Foundation, uh, who looks after Python, uh, I end up joining their uh, grants work group. I was, uh, I was invited to help out to um, uh, read applications from folks who want to run Python related conferences or workshops um, all over the world. And uh, and I'm one of the we need, I think we have nearly uh, someone in each continent, so we get to review um, all these global applications uh, alongside the board as well, because they can't handle all these applications as well. And uh, we we either approve them or not approve them. So last year, I was privileged to be part of that group because last year we had about 220 applications we went through. We all went through, and we uh, granted of I think about quarter million dollars to various groups. And um, that was 2017. So that was a, uh, that was pretty cool being able that to be a small part in that. I mean, it so, sounds like and it has a fantastic future. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great community. But uh, like that, that's, um, but I've, I, but since then I've, I've, um, I'm kind of um, moved back a little bit from Python, like looking for uh, other conference to attend. So I was, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about functional programming, uh, something that melts my brain. So I was uh, lucky enough to attend <laughs> a conference. brain. <laughs> A few years ago, there was a conference called CatConf here in yeah. Dublin, and I really enjoyed it because I did not understand a word they were saying, as opposed to going to a conference where you <laughs> hear slight differences or variations of something you know already, you've heard of, you yeah. yeah. and, and because if you go to a few, conference, few of the, the conferences, but they're in different, in different cities, if you're lucky enough, you might hear the same speaker going through the same talk. So yeah. it's kind of refreshing to hear about something new and unknown. And uh, and all these and the community is just as amazing and, and fun and welcoming as well. So for me, like I'm more going towards um, more kind of language agnostic kind of conferences. Um, kind of so I'm trying to uh, I'm still interested in Python because that's where I built. So it's like a foundation of where I'm right, uh, of of um, how I got to where I am right now. But it uh, but it doesn't stop me to so. 
it hasn't stopped me like going on and seeking other technologies and have a look at it because um, some people saying, oh, you're just fine. It's like, no, I'm not, even though I don't have a clue about other stuff, but I'm still willing to learn. So everyone's, it's, it's good to keep on learning and be curious as well. And do you think, would you, I mean, given your experience, um, do you think you would, you would look at those communities and then decide to start um, events or conferences in those spaces uh, or what, what approach would you take? Or is this just personal learning, a personal learning phase for you right now? It's a personal learning phase yeah. and I will collaborate. Uh, so my husband um, who is interested in Elm. So, uh, um, oh, yeah, yeah. And so he started the meetup group. Uh, I remember when he started meetup group, I was looking at my email and saying, huh, you're invited as organizer of Dublin Elm meetup. And I was Looks like, hang on a minute, who's invited me? Who's doing oh, like, better <laughs> better it's that? Oh, that guy, it's that guy again. So he, he's been stepping back to the community a lot. He was involved with Python Ireland as well, as I said earlier on. Uh, so he started up this group. It's he's a bit busy, so he hasn't been running as many meetups. But uh, I'm happy to, you know, to help him out because he helped me out so much. And I'm also wanting to learn more about Elm as well. And at the moment, uh, other tech, like with other technologies. Uh, if I'm curious about them, I, I rather the people who the community to help the community and collaborate with them, uh, because uh, I don't think I can handle uh, uh, starting up another meetup or you, you, <laughs> yeah, start up another organization again. I just too much on my plate. Yeah, it's pretty stressful. But I mean, you you have all that knowledge and experience, um, you know, and then the, the mentoring actually is a, is a multiplier, isn't it? In in terms of of uh, yeah. the impact you can have. Sharing that knowledge is kind of. Uh, I think it's it's definitely a plus because um, uh, because you get even more involved because you're putting yourself out there and you're sharing what you know with people who want to learn and it's great that you're sharing that and then and then they get to share that um, what they learn to others as well and and it's uh, so in, instead of just word of mouth going to meetups this is like word of mouth educating others in a technology and the words keep spreading and that's uh, I think that's the joy of being in a community absolutely and I wanted to ask you about um, one of the specific tasks that, that you have to do in uh, in running events and conferences which is the uh, the MC role because that involves public speaking um, and do, do you have any specific advice on that because as you said, if you decide to run a conference, one of the things that often ends up happening is that the poor old organizer has to do the the, the emceeing as well, uh, which is a public speaking role. Yeah. Uh, and you give workshops as well, don't you? So yeah, I give advice workshops. on public speaking in general and specifically on the MC role. So the MC role, that's easy um, because you're running the conference. You can pick someone to do the MC. <laughs> so don't do the it. The only thing that you, you can't get out of is opening the conference. So yeah. you have to open up and introduce the, the main the special keynote and then you have to close the conference. So you can't get out of the opening closing of conference, but you can uh, pass on the MC to, to other folks as well. Uh, especially in a conference, you have so many people to, because a lot, some of them could be friends as well, so you can pick on them. No. <laughs> Uh, so with these workshops, it's a lot. Um, it's it's a tiny bit easier because it's a smaller. You don't have to talk in front of like four hundred people, two to four hundred people. You're talking to about fifteen, twenty people. It is a bit nerve wracking initially, and I hate this when people tell me it's down to practice. Yeah. <laughs> And it is true, and I really hate saying this to someone because I know when I asked initially how about advice in public speaking, people saying practice, but. I suppose the best advice is if it's your first time, look for if look for that friendly face in the crowd. If it's especially if you have friends, maybe like seat them in several places so you can actually pan around looking for them and see a friendly space face, a see a friendly face. And also, um, if you don't have um, uh, if you're in a conference and you don't know anyone, look for the people who nod their heads and smile. Uh, uh, and, and not the ones who are nodding off and because they're tired from the previous night or something like that, not because you're boring. Um, because that can be off-putting, seeing someone who isn't paying attention or looking at their phones. And they could be tweeting for all you know about what you're exactly. saying. It could be great. They could be yeah. giving you wonderful tweets. So look for friendly faces. People say, look, um, imagine people are, are, are nude and that doesn't work. Uh, just no, me. no, it doesn't. So <laughs> definitely for people who are, um, if, you, if you have friends in, in, uh, in the crowd, look for them because they'll smile and that makes you smile and relax. And then look for, if you don't have, if you're in a conference uh, all by yourself and you don't know many people, 
don't put all those nodders and all those people who smile and uh, and and definitely just uh, practice in an empty room and just talk out loud like you're a mad person i suppose <laughs> one, uh, one one thing i like to do and it, 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 can, it can be quite tricky because of scheduling that type of stuff is um to try and especially with this uh, this thing where you turn up to a conference and you don't really know anybody is try to do a tiny little bit of networking yeah. in the room before you're about to speak uh, so that you've at least had some human interaction with some of the audience. Um, I find that helps. It, it, it's hard when you're an introvert. Like I, I tend to, when I attend, mm-hmm. I tend to end up putting blinkers on and I try to like figure out what I'm going to see next and figure out kind of if there's a workshop or just trying to figure out like, uh, like I, for some reason, even though I'm trying to welcome people to interact with each other, when it comes to me, when I attend, I end up going, I get become very reserved. I just want to focus on what's happening there. And then, and then the, I find it very hard to interact with people then because I, I, I was just so focused on the conference content itself. Um, but I think what helps is because I go to so many things that people recognize me and wave me, wave me down <laughs> so out of that, you know, out of that focusing on just the program itself and, uh, and you get the chat and then that opens up and then I just kind of come out of my shell a little bit. So yeah. like when I go to events, I'm actually, I'm actually very quiet and kind of quite shy person. But when you're running an event, um, you just don't have a choice. You have to go and welcome people. You have to, you know, make sure everyone is, is, is comfortable and people are talking knew each other and no one's left out so uh so people that's why people think that i'm very kind of uh, open and stuff i say yeah but if i'm running and organizing something that's one that's me but if i'm attending i somehow flip to another personality where i'm very quiet yeah it's it's um i mean it, it sounds like you, you 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 have to manage your own internal mental state to um achieve what you want to for the event yeah so i think that's why it's important for organized to make sure everyone is well is welcome and uh, you know it's like that uh, uh was this someone said uh, you know use the pac-man approach you know when you're talking in a circle make sure you have an opening so someone new can join in instead of uh, feeling left out and not being able to walk in in the middle of a crowd talking and uh, because they might feel that they're rude and um, so i think uh, it's all down to unfortunately down to the organizers themselves making sure everyone is welcome even in a conference um, I suppose you have to make sure that people who are helping you make sure everyone is that people are not left out standing by themselves or maybe people want to stand by themselves and they don't want to be don't want to interact that is also okay um, as well so um, I think it's just how you read the situation and stuff so something so that's why I think like uh, events like big conf- like especially huge conferences it's important to give people um, a quiet space so they can just go in and just say leave me alone I just want to you know you have a quiet and not have a lot of people chatting and everything is really loud and you feel the pressure of having to um, uh, network all the time and some, some people find it overwhelming. Yes. Well, I, we, I, I, I would classify myself as an introvert as well. And it, it absolutely, the, the ability to retreat to somewhere mm. uh, quiet is, uh, you know, I, I would need to do that multiple times if, I, if I'm attending an event to sort of recharge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's it's it, it's it's an important it's 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 an important thing to <laughs> to be able to do. I think. Yeah. Um, is there is there anything in uh, in particular you'd like to mention that you're doing at the moment um, that uh, that that we should know about? Uh, I do have um, like a, I still run pun- a monthly uh, meetups called Pi Ladies Dublin. So it's open to everyone, um, even though the, it has ladies in the title. It's actually uh, it's it's actually a diversely friendly event. Uh, we have like quick talks and lightning talks at the beginning, and people are welcome to bring their laptops in, and uh, they can work on their own projects. That's grand. They can pair up and do tutorials. Uh, they can um, deep dive with the speakers on that particular topic that evening. They can just chit chat and network. Um, they don't have to use the computer if they don't want to. Uh, so it's kind of a free form, free structured, and it's the free events as well. Um, and that's on meetup.com, I, I assume. Meetup.com, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm currently, um, I'm also involved with Women Code Dublin. We do have monthly events as well. And that, that is on the beginning of each month. And then there's, uh, so I'm one of the co-directors and uh, we currently have, I think, about four co-directors and one city lead. 
And so it's, it's actually just done just to, we, we revamped it because we were very quiet for a while. So um, we're very active in running uh, month, monthly events and that is free also. And you can find that at meetup.com. I'm currently um, also trying to organize uh, a couple of events. Um, one of them is, um, if people are interested, is um, in games, in games making in general, uh, a board game and a digital uh, game making kind of game jam. And uh, that's, that's hopefully in September. I don't have much information about that yet, but the organization that I'm running that under is called Gamecraft. And my main, the main thing that I, I, the other, one other organization that I co-founded is called Coding Grace. So that's a, a diversity friendly coding workshops and where I mentor sometimes as well. And we have a lot of mentors from the, from, uh, who are professionals from the field. And uh, I'm currently hopefully working on some workshops, workshop content uh, um, in the coming months. So I don't, uh, so all that is on meetup.com. Uh, so uh, all those groups. So people want to just contact me as well uh, via meetup.com. I'm happy to answer any questions or run events or collaborate. That's wonderful. Well, I, I, I really don't know how you find time to sleep at all. It's an, an amazing list of uh, events and, and community stuff to be involved in. Uh, Vicky, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, this has been really, really interesting uh, and, and quite inspirational as well. I think, um, you know, it, it, it shows how, if you start, if you start getting involved in the community, you can work your way up to running events and speaking at events and all that sort of stuff. So it's, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's really great to have a role model to, to show us how that's done. Like it, as, as, um, the only reason why I got involved with community is, um, if you need something done, um, you, you whine about it for so long until you realize I can do this as well. So that's how things get started is, you know, if there's something missing and you know, you can do it, go and do it. Um, um, you know, uh, the worst that happen is like, you know, uh, the group can get huge and you don't have to be the organizer. That's the worst, worst, <laughs> That's the worst that can happen. <laughs> you can find the transcript of this podcast and any links mentioned on our podcast page at voxgig.com slash podcast. Subscribe for weekly editions where we talk to the people who make the developer community work. For even more, read our newsletter. You can subscribe at voxgig.com slash newsletter or follow our Twitter at voxgig. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time.